fight the Reds. Um, well, we have to understand the thinking at the time. Uh, and the thinking at the time was, was in, uh, sort of suffused by the ideas of a long dead economist, in fact, the world's first paid economist, Thomas Malthus. Uh, now, you'll know, uh, I mean, Th Thomas Malthus was paid by the, the British East India Company, and his, his days were filled with making sure that uh, that company's colonial exploits were uh, profitable. But he dabbled in uh, theories of population that nowadays bear his name. Um, and uh, you, you, you'll, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to say that I don't have a PowerPoint presentation today. I mean, what we're going to do is use our imaginations as once we used to. Um, but what I'd like you to do is imagine the, the, the sort of Malthusian graph. Uh, now, if, if, you, if you've not seen it before, imagine, Malthus sort of observed two very simple things. One is that food production grows arithmetically. So it's kind of a, a straight sort of line and it goes up like that. But population growth moves uh, exponentially, it moves geometrically. So at some point, population grows and grows and grows, but, but food production can't keep up. And at some point, those two lines cross. Uh, and at that moment, Malthus worried, uh, would be a moment of great social upheaval and turmoil. Uh, and uh, th there, would be, there would be strife and struggle, particularly as the poor, who were breeding and eating, uh, were, would, uh, yeah, would find that their, their appetites, um, were, their sexual appetites out, uh, yeah, outrun the food that was able to, to sustain the, 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 their progeny. Now, of course, this is, I mean, it, it's a very kind of reductionist attitude to, to, to the working classes. I mean, the, 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 all working classes are doing of shagging and eating. Uh, and, <laughs> Uh, and, th and, and this is what's driving population. This, this is the sort of uh, the, the idea behind it. But, but bear in mind, of course, you know, at, at the time, a number of countries uh, were, you know, were falling to communism. In, uh, and, and the United States was worried about precisely this moment of when people get angry, what do they do? They, they reach for the nearest political ideology. And then, you know, in the, at, at the, that particular time, the nearest political ideology was communism. And if people get angry and hungry in the cities, they will go communist. And in order to head that off, the Green Revolution uh, and, its, you know, it, uh, and its sort of increasing agricultural production would be a way of feeding people, particularly in the cities, and heading off this Malthusian moment at the pass. Now, again, I mean, if, if this sounds absurd, bear in mind that that thinking is still with us. Uh, if you look to the, uh, what, what gets called the, 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 the Arab Spring, the, the, the Mediterranean uprisings uh, that, that have characterized the beginning of this year, you'll see some of it at work. Uh, I mean, what happened in Tunisia when, when uh, President Ben Ali fled. The, the last thing he did in order to hang on to his dictatorship, what did he do? He dropped the price of bread by 30%. It, for, for him, the idea is that people would be less angry, their hunger would be slaked, uh, their hunger for change would be slaked by regular bread. But of course, they were hungry for much more than food, uh, although global food prices had made food really the, the spark that lit some of the, the, the uprisings in, uh, it, it, that we've seen around the Mediterranean. So, it's, it, it, the, the thinking that, that motivated the Green Revolution is something that's actually sort of still with us today, the sort of Malthusian worries about what happens when people get angry. Um, but bear in mind also that uh, th th there's, a, there's another component to, to uh, the, the Green Revolution. It's not just about food production, it's also about population control. Um, and population control was really the other sort of leg of the Green Revolution. Um, and uh, I mean, again, William Goud, when, when he was uh, presenting uh, at the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs, um, said that, that uh, I mean, we, we, he was very worried about, the, uh, about population growth, and he, he warned that it, to avoid a, a worsening of the population food situation during the years be beyond 1985, that may even reach an economically or ecologically irreversible balance, it is imperative to institute uh, intensive programs of family planning right now. Uh, and in fact, w w if you look at the, the congressional records, uh, although uh, fertilizer companies are mentioned, the, the companies that are mentioned most in the, in the congressional records around the Green Revolution are drug companies who are selling population control devices, uh, population control drugs. But there's a third leg of the Green Revolution. It's not just about the seeds, it's not just about population control. Uh, the third leg that's often forgotten um, is that it's about state support. Uh, again, let, let me read you some of the testimony, because it's important for us to have this sense of history so that we, we have a grounding in what it is that we need if we're, if we're to move forward. Um, the, and, and again, this is William Gowan saying, look, new seeds, more fertilizer, better water management, improved pesticides and, pesticides and insecticides, these are all important weapons in the fight to achieve self-sufficiency in food, but they will not do the job alone. Not only must these be available to the farmer, but he must have credit to buy them. He must know how to use them properly. He must be able to get a decent price for his crop, and he must be able to get it to market. 
And Thomas Morgan, uh, the chair of the committee uh, in, in which Goud was testifying, would reminded him that look, in the past, members of this committee have found that there were cases where assistance was applied to agriculture, but the operation was frustrated because the farmers had no inducement to adopt improved methods because they derived very little from their increased production. And William Goud responded by citing the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Chile, and Brazil as examples where higher prices were given to farmers. Uh, and and th it was these higher prices and the state support and the marketing boards uh, that get primary credit, uh, to, to use Goud's words, for, for providing the incentive to grow more. And again, I, I, I think it's worth remembering uh, that the, the marketing boards as uh, we, we are engulfed in the debate about whether the private sector is a good replacement for them. Now, sorry, I'm just gonna grab some water here. Um, now, that's important to remember. Well, this is important to remember because, uh, yeah, this is all, yeah, not too much space back in, am I? Um, what, what we see here is when we think about the Green Revolution, we, we're already encouraged to misremember it. The Green Revolution, we are told, is really just about better seeds and you know, pesticides and you know, the, the, their modern version today is genetically modified crops. But in fact, th there were two other things. I mean, it, it, it was also about population control. It was also about state support. But the other thing that we're, that, that we're encouraged to forget is that it was about authoritarianism. If you look at the, the countries that William Goud cited, the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Chile, Brazil, these are all countries where, in order for the Green Revolution to succeed, the state had to get incredibly heavy-handed. Um, if, if you look to I India, for example, the, the heyday of the Green Revolution in India, which we are told helped stave off hunger in India, the heyday of the Green Revolution was Indira Gandhi's state of emergency. Uh, her state of emergency was one in which uh, 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 there was uh, widespread uh, uh, detention without cause, uh, but also uh, you know, the Green Revolution was pushed out, these credits of the marketing boards were made available to farmers uh, s who had land. There was no land reform, of course. Uh, this is, again, a way of preventing land reform. It was a way of making sure that farmers who were on the land stayed on the land and no one else challenged them for it, because, again, this was, you know, land reform was unthinkable because communism was precisely the, uh, the enemy here. But also Indira Gandhi, uh, in her state of emergency, uh, often with support of the, the foundations that pushed the Green Revolution, um, instituted uh, widespread compulsory, c compulsory sterilization. This is, again, part of the, 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 the legacy of the Green Revolution that we're, we're encouraged to forget. Now, you might say, well, look, it's, it's not, that's not great. Um, but, but OK, but, but did it? Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things came out of the, the, the Cold War and, and the battle against communism. Some of them actually weren't bad. The welfare state in Europe, for example. Uh, the welfare state in Europe was precisely designed to prevent people from going communist. The, the welfare state in Europe was a compromise. It was a way in which governments gave a little bit uh, so, that, uh, so that their workers wouldn't look uh, you know, anxiously across the Iron Curtain and wonder whether the, the, their comrades across the barrier were getting a better deal. So, so maybe there are good things about, you know, even if it comes from the Cold War and there's some unpleasant politics that we can put to one side, uh, maybe it did feed the world. Well, now here's an interesting thing. I, mean, uh, I, I want to quote my friend Peter Rossett, who said, look, if you eliminate China from the analysis of hunger at the end of the Green Revolution, the number of hungry people in the rest of the world during the Green Revolution period actually increased by more than 11%, uh, from uh, 536 million to 597 million. In South America, where per capita food su supplies rose by 8%, the number of hungry people also went up by 19%. And of course, again, this is something that, that we need look, not, not look terribly far uh, to, to find. Uh, in this province, with massive agricultural surpluses, uh, as, as Brett reminded us, you know, on, on what used to be indigenous land, uh, levels of food insecurity in this province are, I am told, around, 20, uh, sorry, around 10%. Uh, and the majority of people who are going hungry and who are food insecure are those very uh, Aboriginal people uh, from whom this land was taken. Now, you may say, all right, well, fine. It, it, it's, it's, it, but, 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 but notwithstanding some of, the, you know, some of these problems, uh, maybe, maybe, there, there are, maybe it was good for the environment. Um, and that's, that, that's a, an argument that Norman Borlaug himself made uh, in, in what's called the, the Borlaug hypothesis. Um, Norman Borlaug said, look, if, if we hadn't adopted these intensive agricultural practices, uh, using a lot more fertilizer and pesticide rather than, the, the alternative would have been that instead of using around uh, 600 million hectares of land, we'd, we'd have to use eight, 1,800, so three, three times as, as much land uh, in order to overcome, uh, to, to meet the needs of the world. And so what the Green Revolution has done is actually been environmentally friendly. Um, 
Now, it's worth taking that argument seriously. I mean, is, has, it been, has it been environmentally friendly? Well, th th there are two ways of answering this argument. One is to, to observe that uh, fertilizer consumption has increased by you know, over 4% per year between uh, 1961 and 98. Uh, and now fertilizer accounts for 2% of global energy use. Uh, and w we are wedded more than ever before to a system uh, of uh, agricultural production that demands carbon. Um, we can also look at the, the, the sacrifice of agronomic resilience. So by, by encouraging widespread monoculture, we have lost uh, genetic biodiversity. We've lost, we lost the resilience of uh, uh, agricultural systems that are perhaps better adapted to climate change, and I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, and it's also, in 1992, it was also found that about a quarter of all irrigated land using uh, industri industri and green revolution technology suffered from salinization. So w we, can, we can see that, that at some level, while Borlaug may have a point uh, in, terms of the, you know, in, in terms of the opportunity cost, and again, we'll, we'll think about that, um, there has been widespread environmental damage as a result of these intensive agricultural practices. And the trouble is that once you get on the pesticide and fertilizer treadmill, you're on it forever. Uh, th th that uh, in order to maintain the yields of, of these monocultures, one is wedded continually to buying these, uh, these fertilizers and pesticides, and in the long run, uh, they have long-term environmental uh, degradations uh, and long-term environmental costs that never feature in the price of the goods that we, that, that, that we receive. Um, but I think the, the, the more sophisticated response to Borlaug, the more sophisticated response to saying, well, you know, to Norman Borlaug saying, look, if it hadn't been for these kinds of things, we'd be using three times as much land, is to ask, well, is it? To, to ask the question about opportunity cost. I mean, e economics has a, at its heart a very interesting idea of cost, which is the, the opportunity cost of, uh, of, of these kinds of, of, of this, this kind of farming involved a tremendous amount of resources and a tremendous amount of state support, a tremendous amount of environmental damage. Um, what if we had used the resources differently? Would we, be, uh, would we have been able to achieve as much uh, and to, to grow as much uh, as we have been through industrial agriculture? And that's a question to which I want to answer yes, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to, to, uh, to, to move now to sort of think about examples of that happening. But before I do, I, I, I also want to just point out that the Green Revolution is still alive and well. Um, remember that the Green Revolution, uh, in its success, has achieved a few things. Uh, in its success, it, it strengthened the hand of the, of, of, of the model of industrial agriculture so that, in fact, industrial agriculture sort of colonized our idea of what is possible. Green Revolution thinking now seems to be the only show in town uh, because, uh, because of a misrepresentation of its history and a misrepresentation of its costs. Uh, and so now, w when one thinks of uh, you know, profound agricultural change, the Green Revolution seems to be the only game that we're allowed to play. Uh, it, at the same time, it required authoritarian pro-business states. It created a capitalist class very interested in agriculture with ambitions in agriculture. It allowed fertilizer companies to grow to become not just, uh, not, not move, not just move into life sciences, but also into financial services. Um, it has legitimated the, the role of, uh, of unaccountable and very large foundations in the, role in the world of agriculture. And if people have questions about, say, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think that would be a very interesting question to ask. Um, and it has, at the same time, eradicated a great deal of biodiversity and knowledge about seed, often women's knowledge about seeds, uh, that, uh, that I think is, is of tremendous value uh, in helping us get to a, a system of agriculture uh, that, is, that is important. And, and perhaps most of all, and, and least acknowledged, and I think that this is something that's new and we're only coming to see the full consequences of, the Green Revolution in the countries where it, where it was applied drove up the price of land. And again, one doesn't need to look terribly far uh, to, to, to see that. Uh, I, I remember seeing in, in one of the financial uh, papers uh, advice from a columnist saying, look, foreigners, if you can get around the restriction, then the best deal in agriculture, the best deal in land, no matter what kind, in the world today is to be found in Canada. Canada's agricultural land is a gold mine. And if only foreigners can get around the restrictions of not being able to buy more than 20 acres of it, uh, then uh, Canadian land is a gold mine. Uh, but in every country where agricultural land has, uh, where the Green Revolution has been implemented, the price of agricultural land has gone up. And that's why today we're seeing a scramble for land in the countries where the Green Revolution and where the battle for, against communism didn't spend too much time. And in particular, I'm thinking of Africa. And that's where I want to turn now. Because in, since 2009, I mean, in 2009, we saw uh, a scramble for Africa uh, unlike, you know, really, that hasn't been seen for a hundred years. Um, uh, you, 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 you see it reported in the European press with, with, a, with a certain amount of, um, 
awkwardness uh, wh where you see uh, reports about how in 2009 an area the size of France uh, was grabbed by foreigners in it, moving into a number of countries, mainly Africa, uh, buying up the best land. Uh, uh, you know, not, not, I mean, you know, Africa has a lot of land, but no one's grabbing the Sahara. Right? They're, they're going for land that has good access to good water and good infrastructure. Uh, and when the European press uh, sort of cover it, they say, you won't believe what India and China and America and Brazil are doing. They're doing what we did. Um, uh, and yet, you, you see, I mean, when you look at the, the, the move for the new scramble for land in Africa, it's pr precisely from the, you know, the, the countries that used authoritarian means to, to develop their own green revolution, where the price of land is sky high, particularly agricultural land. Um, and th they're finding that land is incredibly cheap by comparison in Africa. Uh, now, you know, my, you know, if you look at the price of agricultural land in, in India, for example, my, my, uh, my, my in-laws have, have a farm in, in, uh, near uh, Chandigarh in, in, in Punjab, and they've been offered tens, tens of thousands of dollars for a single acre of their land, um, mainly by unscrupulous property developers who think that they can game the system um, and can convert this agricultural land into condos. Um, but of course, that mechanism is precisely what's happening in Africa. Al although we are told, look, this is, you know, this is the free market at work, uh, th th that you know, th th there are willing buyers and willing sellers, there's nothing of the kind in Africa. In fact, what, what a lot of the research is showing is that in the scramble for Africa, investors are going for places where there isn't a willing seller at all. There's a willing buyer and a, a, and a powerful intermediary who is able to turf poor people off their land uh, so that uh, you know, foreign agricultural interests are able to, to, to buy up this land uh, and, and use it to, to then export uh, food back home. Um, now, I, the, the reason I, I, I mention this is because, it, it, although th th this is one of the, the, the ways in which we are encouraged to think that Africa is going to be able to, to develop is by you know, uh, uh, offering out its land to, to agricultural uh, investors, um, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a way that, that so far has resulted in anything beneficial for, for, for people in Africa. Um, again, I'm, I'm using World Bank data here, and they're, they're tremendously inc inclined to find this a good thing. Uh, but even they, with uh, as, much, um, uh, you know, a, a, as much effort as they, they could, found that uh, in, in Africa, the land grabs had hurt everyone, particularly women, uh, particularly people who had, who had been denied access to the water rights that they needed in order to be able to survive. Um, now, the, the, the country that I, 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 really want, I, I want to end with a few examples from um, is Malawi. And, I, and, and in this, I, I follow the work of a, a fantastic young Canadian academic, Rachel Besner Kerr, who has been my guide to, to things happening in Malawi. Um, now, Malawi, uh, for, for me, was a very exciting place at the beginning of, uh, of, of this century, because Malawi seemed to be a country that, that had decided to go a different way from the way that, that uh, you know, organizations like the World Bank had been telling it to go. I mean, bear in mind, of course, uh, Th there's been a lot of investment in agriculture in Malawi, um, although, although, uh, and, and, in, and in Africa in general. Although we're told uh, that the Green Revolution hasn't hit Africa, there's the, the international, uh, the, the consultative group on international agricultural research has been, for the past 25 years, spending nearly half its budget, half of its budget of $350 million a year, researching crops in Africa. You know, the leg, of, of going back to the Green Revolution, the leg of uh, investment in science around agriculture, that's been, that's been well invested in in Africa. Uh, but what the World Bank has for a very long time encouraged Africa to do is disinvest uh, its, its state support. And so it, you know, Africa managed to get rid of its marketing boards long before uh, Canada has. Um, and that's and to, to tremendous ill effect. Um, even the World Bank has admitted that as a result of these policies, um, you know, in, in Africa, the, invi you know, the invisible hand was meant to come and redistribute resources in Africa. Uh, and uh, getting rid of the marketing, marketing boards was meant to be opening the door to the private sector. Uh, but uh, following this advice in the 1980s, you know, the invisible hand was nowhere to be seen. Um, you know, th th these marketing boards were eliminated and the private sector didn't come to Africa. Um, and so what Malawi did was give the corn finger, I'm told, it's, uh, is, is what it's called here, to, um, d d d to development institutions like the World Bank. Uh, and instead, uh, Malawi started to invest in its farmers, which we have since discovered is exactly the right thing to do. You, sh you should be investing in farmers and agriculture. If you want to fight poverty in the global south, you need to invest in agriculture. The downside is that the way Malawi decided to invest was by giving farmers fertilizer vouchers. Um, now, 
the, the, the trouble with this is, is manifold, of course. You know, again, we can get to the, the green revolution problems. But also, the trouble with fertilizer is that expen it's expensive. And Malawi is an incredibly poor country with nothing to export, really, other than tobacco. Uh, and uh, tobacco prices haven't been doing too well. And so in 2008, uh, Malawi was committed to these fertil fertilizer vouchers, and uh, it bought fertilizer at the top of the market. I mean, in 2008, the price of fertilizer more than doubled in this global food crisis. And as a result of that, uh, Malawi uh, found that it had emptied its reserves of dollars. Of course, it didn't help that, 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 you know, that, that the, uh, the, the president of Malawi also decided that year to buy a jet. Um, uh, that also helped to drain down the foreign exchange reserves. But all of a sudden then, Malawi had found itself bankrupt. Um, and although there had been uh, increases in yields as a result of these fertilizers, um, the, it wasn't the fertilizers that were doing all the work. If, if, again, if you, if you look at the sort of traje trajectory of yields of corn, for example, in Malawi, you, you, uh, at one level you can tell the story of, yes, the fertilizers came in and there was a bad year, and then the fertilizer program came in, and, and then the yields doubled. But the main reason that the yields doubled was because of the rains coming back. Um, so w when one hears stories about the Malawi miracle, about how 